We are now going to look at some ways mythological archetypes, specifically symbols, that carry widespread social understanding in mainstream entertainment and other broadcasting. This is a well-known current show. I want to explore the comparison between some featured characters and their association with the Arthurian legend. The symbol of the sword carries out intention. In Game of Thrones, the swords are named, but the sword in the logo is iconic and doesn't represent a sword in the actual series. Excalibur, in the Tales of King Arthur, can only be wielded by one with pure intent, and this is decided by either a stone from which the sword is drawn or from the Lady of the Lake, who grants it to Arthur when Merlin acts as a liaison between Arthur and the powers that possessed Excalibur. Looking to a couple of key heroes in the TV series, both Jon Snow and his blood brother Rob Stark, parallel Arthur but in different aspects. The guide in the series is not designated as one individual, but rather a collection of characters who are figuring out their place in the world over and over again. God's Wood provides a steady source of sacred space that the Stark family and other northerners consult, a direct archetype of nature with no intermediary. In the Arthur tales, Merlin always exists as the guide. Taking a look at the female archetypes, first at the talismans of power. In Game of Thrones, the dragon's eggs are a valuable relic of the past that come to life and become a powerful piece in the story. In the older tale, the grail is the sought-after prize in many versions of the story. It may have been a hybrid symbol of the former Celtic cauldron that bore powers of renewal and in the Christian grail that caught the blood of the crucified Christ. In both stories, whoever possessed the talisman possessed the power it held. Referencing Daenerys in comparison to Guinevere to start, Daenerys mirrors the role of the maiden or child bride, as Guinevere does in the older legend, but then Daenerys becomes a force of unknown potential with a darker aspect. The dark side of female characters is shown with a number of characters who bear various degrees of dark behavior, Whereas, in many legends of the Arthur tale, the Dark Lady is pretty much focused on Morgana, or Morgan Le Fay, depending on the tale. The varied degrees of personality control could be compared to the Roman Furies, terrifying female forces of rage. Guinevere's maiden and queen also shows up again as the mother and sister of the Stark family. These various aspects of character components are symbolic of personality traits existing in humanity, the archetypes of our collective unconscious and the work of Carl Jung that Joseph Campbell worked with. As we look at a number of other popular shows, keeping the archetypal framework in mind, what symbols do we see? Heroes. Phoenix. Or the songbird fallen and risen again with new fire. We also have the family-friendly shows, borrowing from a selected context, the relevance of these shows part real and part suggested. Here again the Furies, and here again the Risen Dead. But what real relevance do these symbols have to us in our living world? Historically, television audiences were considered somewhat captive, attention held for the commercial break, awaiting the next climactic part of each story. Though we have far more options these days to select the complete story free from interruption. Though the ancient Greeks may not have had commercials delivered quite so frequently, they would have had some means to communicate the local happenings. In Greece, the current events were referred to as a mythos. It wasn't until poets began to get creative with the retelling that Plato began to protest the validity of the tales told to that point. Plato did much to to begin classifying myth as invented stories instead of actual events. What now is the purpose of myth? 
How do myths such as the Iliad come into being? According to the philosophy outlined in the Gaian Mythos, articles on the metahistory.org website, myths could be cultivated from a consultation between the writer of the myth and the muse. In most ancient cases, the author was unknown, the tale being passed from generation to generation verbally through art and interpretation or by early forms of theater. What was it to consult the muse? Based on studies of Western myth and classical art, the muse is an aspect of a very old deity, the goddess of memory. When poets from ancient times turned to the muse for inspiration, they were opening to a source of information larger than their own interpretive faculties were attempting to produce independently. Poets like Virgil, who wrote the Latin Aeneid in 70 BCE, directly asked the muse to help him retell events from the founding of Rome in 747 BCE. These ancients were seeking to help recount a tale or to create one with an open mind, drawing from a pool of greater knowing. Could this have been a literal act of tapping into a collective consciousness? The Gaian mythos discusses our current challenge to create a modern mythology drawing knowledge from our current collective consciousness, again creating context through which humanity can relate to the planet and universe. The time for this is perfect. Our attention span has evolved to process the increasing amount of information we are inundated with daily. Though many of us have developed ways to filter information, we still have the opportunity to access more of it than ever before. The growth rate of social media networks over the past 20 years reflects that we are both accessing and sharing more information. To some, our changing attention span indicates a lack of focus, and to others it indicates an increase in multitasking capability, our attention moving more quickly from one concept to another, grasping essential points as sought. This leads us back to one of the co-founders of the term noosphere, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He was both an ordained Jesuit priest and an esteemed paleontologist who was surprisingly outspoken about evolution for his time, a concept the church did not support, forbidding him to publish his work during his lifetime. De Chardin's philosophy of tangential and radial energy reportedly hit him while on a dig in Egypt. As he sat holding a rock while on the hunt for some ancient relics of humanity among layers of earth, the notion of a divine spark within each and everything on this planet came into his sphere of consciousness. Was it the microbial marvels solidified in rock, exhibiting some kind of evidence of once active life, in this sense similar to a tissue sample taken from a living being? Was it the pyramids he was in proximity to, the base of which bore the apex, the point, the most skyward-facing bit of these megastructures? He called this spark tangential energy, the energy of within. Examining the rock further, and later, he considered the molecules that formed the rock to be solidified, causing an internal shape to its tangential spark. He contemplated the earth layers, the composites of the surfaces and endless geometry of these forms build up around the internal sparks within. The outer form of the rock was radial, the measurable physical manifestation evident and resting in his palm. De Chardin compared the supporting and underlying form of the pyramid to be radial, in the sense that it supported its central apex. From the point of his realization with the rock, he began to see the planet and all forms manifesting upon it in a new way, taking into account the evolving thought patterns of humanity as well as other species. With humanity's consciousness evolution, he identified patterns of separation that spanned all elements of society, save love. Love he considered a unifying force. In loving, people unite via reflection, looking within themselves, with love, an act of involution. Perhaps this was comparable to Jung's anima animus philosophy and the persona that a consciousness chooses to put out there. Looking for a moment at three of Jung's principles in the unconscious and conscious mind, we see the male-female aspect of each individual. The persona is the mask one presents to the world. Could the spark be the interplay of these forces within us each, the push-pull behind each present moment radial through the internal mask to 
the consciousness wears. De Chardin goes on to describe the close-range love exhibited in the family as evidence of humanity's capability to love and therefore unite in a wider radius than the nuclear family. This was a potential he was exploring in the middle of the 20th century. In this, the 21st century, we have connection capability that allows us to radiate unifying intent in vast and unpredictable ways, with the potential to bridge gaps caused by eons of separating systems that have developed. This technological jump affords us the individual opportunity to emanate authentic good, while simultaneously allowing us the option of crystallizing our separate states of being. If we look at his philosophy of tangential energy as a source of information, inspiration, or intention, theoretically we could view television as a radio form of energy coming from a source reaching a mass audience. The luminous box itself reading a series of stories that each had an inspired beginning, a concept, an idea that started with an individual or group of individuals working to manifest the original idea. These manifestations take the shape of broadcast media and in these examples, different tales. These various television shows and movies are often the recreation of older stories that use selected archetypes to represent characters we can identify based on our collective recorded legends. I am asking now why so many of these stories explore the dark, solidifying fears and retelling nightmares in ever more graphic detail. In seeking entertainment and possibly escape from the monotony of day-to-day living, What benefit does this offer humanity in relation to our biological reality? What kind of unconscious associations are being made by the mass consciousness in terms of their individual relationships to the universe? Television shows used to be called programs. I'd like to draw a comparison here between entertainment programs and software programs. Used as a plural noun, a program is defined as a series of planned events or performances example, a weekly program of films. As a verb, a program is defined as the code provided to a computer or other machine, giving it instructions for the automatic performance of a particular task or to arrange information according to a plan or schedule. In terms of our collective consciousness, what purpose does an abundance of dark television programming serve? If the author was a computer programmer, These nightmares would be considered directions entered into a collective database. What is a TV audience in this sense? Society considers the audience human and responsible for their actions, led by their decisions. If understanding is based on a collection of experiences and lessons learned, what kind of understanding would a TV audience have in regards to the world if they had watched a continuous series of violent shows? Or are we to consider TV and the world totally unrelated? We are expected to treat them as such. Is it truly entertaining media, or is it just captivating because it's dramatic? Drama entices the audience to hang on in order to find out or learn what happens next. The selection of dark and violent subjects that explore characters on emotional, psychological, physical, and spiritual levels creates connections between the audience and the broadcasters. Over the span of any given human lifetime, the viewer is paying attention to these programs with these connections forming an ongoing perception of this broadcast world of fantasy and selective media. Don't believe everything you see on TV. How easy is that, though, when so many hours of passive attention are captivated by the drama of these selected storylines? How motivated are we to take part in the actual events that occur in our active lifetime? The call to adventure never stopped coming from the biological world. Natural disasters demand action to help people survive them. Widespread hunger persists, people are treated poorly, personal rights and liberties are wicked away in our collective reality, and many of us sit sit transfixed in front of boxes radiating a few dark stories and very few light ones under the guise of entertainment. Our tangential energy potential in those cases is limited by the amount of radiant energy we accept from these television programs. Our inspired moments happen. What we choose to do with those ideas either enhances our radiant potential, or we trade that radiance for entertainment, our escape from our daily work and challenges. The gifts of industry have provided us with new devices for entertainment. 
convenient evolutions from the television, smart technology. With our evolving attention span, we can choose to use these products of the industrial age to take an active role in the current information age. These little tools have granted us the ability to begin broadcasting our intent, enabling each individual spark of tangential energy to radiate further in the world than we've ever been able to in recorded history. Authentic connections formed between people are happening in real time in our waking lives as we walk together and talk, as we share creations amongst ourselves, as we build upon collective dreams in our local communities. Social media is a tool available to help us in these. The value I see in it is the resonant awareness growing around connections such as these, communicated effectively to the macrocosmic digital universe. As humanity develops tangible solutions and broadcasts them, a new mythology grows in our collective social space, where our digital, global brain is now taking the opportunity to build upon an understanding that bears real mutual benefit to humans and the planet alike. It's vital that we put our real-life connections first, our feet on the ground, standing and breathing reality, a part of our biological state of being. Technology provides the tools. It's essential that we use them as such, rather than avenues of escape. For escape leads us to captivity in this sense, our attention held in the pattern designed for us to follow, inroads to old stories manipulated to serve commercial interests. In the Gaian Hypothesis, James Lovelock explains in scientific terms that humanity is essentially not the biological priority of Earth's systems, but we are a participating part of them and will continue to be so if we choose to learn from these systems and adapt to them. If we continue to allow our attention to be focused by others, our realities will be shaped by them, and the resulting biological reality will continue to evolve along the course of industry, driven by profit, disregarding actual prosperity for most of humanity and all of our coming generations. We can choose to dedicate a portion of our attention to participating in a new future, however, one that uses these amazing advances in technology to ensure a tangible future for humanity on planet Earth. The outcome of my dance with the Gaian mythos has led me to find ways to celebrate and explore the potential of community-based agriculture, the organic, sustainably produced kind. Clarify your intention and discover your unique adventure. Share it and add to a modern living mythology.